Mario Plus Rabbids Kingdom Battle exclusive. Top 10 secret bosses of all time. Plus, our review of Nintendo's new handheld. This is the IGN show. This is the IGN show? This one. Oh, awesome. This is William Haynes. We're on TV, so take that, high school guidance counselors. Coming up on today's show, a review of the new Nintendo 2DS XL. It has a great look, but will you miss not having the 3D? Plus, Alana goes all out for some Gears of War 4 cosplay, and we'll make liberal use of the pause button to reveal all the Easter eggs in Steven Spielberg's Ready Player One trailer. <laughs> but first, it's time to talk about the fall's weirdest video game crossover. Mario plus rabbits plus rocket launchers. One of the craziest reveals of E3 was the new game from Nintendo and Ubisoft, Mario plus rabbits Kingdom Battle. Alana's got the latest in the Nintendo Switch game and an exclusive look at the co-op map. Excited to be sitting next to Davide Soliani, the creative director of Mario Plus Rabbids Kingdom Battle today. For anyone who hasn't heard of what this game is exactly, how would you explain it? I will say that it's a beautiful adventure where Mario and the rabbits embark on a, an incredible journey to save the mushroom kingdom. So what is it like working with someone like Miyamoto on bringing Mario into the rabbits universe or vice versa? Ah, it's an emotional moment. Uh, uh, it was you basically became a meme at E3. Yes. <laughs> How was uh, that? <laughs> yes. I was not ready for that. No, you, it was you know. amazing. Yeah, we basically spent three years and a half working like crazy on this game, putting all our love and commitment. And then uh, finally the reveal uh, moment at E3 was such a big moment for me. And then the Miyamoto stage was calling out for my name. I think I did the same thing. It's absolutely <laughs> awesome. Having these two separate franchises pulled together, what have you pulled from yeah. Mario and what have you pulled yeah. from Rabbids to make this one complete package? Since from the beginning we said we should play around the contrast between those two universes. And we say, how cool it could be if the Rabbids, because Mario is well known as a hero mm -hmm. and Rabbids are well known as crazy, funny kind of character. So we said, how cool it could be if the rabbits throughout the game learn from Mario how to become heroes, hmm. and Mario learns from uh, the rabbits how to crack a joke. What about in terms of gameplay? How do you think the two combine? We played a lot with the parody, and parody is uh, the use and misuse of very iconic uh, elements, mm -hmm. uh, mostly from the Nintendo world. So we played with the Nintendo mechanics, and but we twisted them. Mm -hmm. Well, I definitely like everything that I played and very excited to show you guys right now. We have a clip from a brand new never before seen level. Check it out. So, Alana, you got to play the game. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's too weird for Mario fans? I kind of think that's the lovable charm of it is how weird it is. I think that having the Rabbids, which are really, really goofy and really creatively animated team with the characters that we know and love from Mario is just a really cool pairing that I think a lot of people are gonna get attached to. Hmm. Okay, final hypothetical question. Let's say I'm not into Rabbids and I'm not into turn-based tactics or strategy, but I am into Mario. Do you think this is still a game for me? <sighs> it's hard to say. I think if you've never played a turn-based tactics game, then this is a good one to start on. But if you are like a purist and you just play XCOM, you probably won't like this so much, but uh, I definitely think there's appealing parts for Mario fans alone. There's a lot of worlds to explore that have Mario kind of Easter eggs in them, like uh, red coins and there's some platforming in there. It's really creative even when you aren't actually in combat. Well, I for one am looking forward to it. There are some really difficult bosses out there, but nothing can prepare you for what you're about to see. Here is part one of the top 10 secret bosses of all time. Here are our 10 favorite secret bosses in video games. 
Back in 1995, the idea of Square and Nintendo making a game together seemed impossible. But lo and behold, Super Mario RPG was gifted to the world, along with its ridiculously tough boss, Culex. In the dark corners of Monster Town resides a foe who shrugs off Super Mario RPG's 2.5D aesthetics and goes straight up Final Fantasy on the plumber and his crew. Seeing his iconic crystals, hearing the Final Fantasy music, and finally taking down Culex was one of the most satisfying moments in the entire game. Destiny fans are about as hardcore as they come, so it's no surprise the secret boss is only available when the daily heroic mission Lost to Light shows up at random. The level collapses at its end, but there's a hidden path that leads to Drivix, the Chosen. Players have a mere 10 minutes to complete the task. The worlds of the Elder Scrolls games are rife with secrets, but few are as cool as Karstag in Skyrim. Going through the rigorous steps to summon the ghostly frost giant is quite the feat, but the reward is absolutely worth it. If you manage to slay the beast, the Dragonborn is given the ability to summon the powerful creature three times, and while you can't summon him indefinitely, trust us, it's still worth it. Spelunky is a game that necessitates replaying, and it has a catalog of YouTube videos and mind-melting speedruns to prove it. But deep down the well of Derek Yu's rogue platformer is Yama, the game's ultimate boss. If you manage to fulfill the litany of requirements needed to enter the hidden area, you're rewarded with an incredibly tough fight against King Yama. Bloodborne's insanely hideous Moon Presence. Sure, the fight with this celestial Lovecraftian nightmare is amazing in and of itself, but it's the steps that you have to take in order to summon the beast that secured its place on this list. I mean, how many bosses can you think of that require you to consume multiple umbilical cords in order to fight? The one question we get asked the most is, can you get me an NES classic? And no, we can't, I can't even get one. But the second most frequent question is one we can answer, which is what are you playing? Naomi, what have you been up to? I've been playing a lot of Z Breath of the Wild because mm -hmm. I've been traveling a lot and the Nintendo Switch is so perfect for that. Where are you at in terms of the... Uh, uh, getting the Divine Beasts has been my main quest, but I've been doing a lot of the character season shrines, like trying to get as many of those possible before I want to Yeah. <laughs> How about you, James? I've been playing Fortnite, if you'll remember that game announcement from uh, 1994. <laughs> was, Way was, back in the it day. It was a long time ago, but anyway, it's essentially a zombie survival game. Thank you. you get together with your friends, you scavenge stuff around like an urban area or a rural area, and then you build a fort around a central uh, objective and just defend it from zombies. So pretty basic, but there are these classes, uh, like a soldier, a ninja, all the different ways you can play. There's a lot of customization. Just in terms of combat, it feels very good. The base gameplay is really fun. There's this other element, though, when you get out of the game, where there's this crazy kind of freemium progression happening. There are daily rewards. There's like a lot of stuff you would expect to see in a mobile game is in this game, uh, and it's a little bit too intricate, a little bit too tedious, so I'm not as much into that. But what about you? I'm actually playing uh, a lot of Nier Automata, which came out earlier this year on PS4, and I kind of don't even know how to begin to explain it, except that it's very Japanese, it's very weird, really unique art style, crazy, crazy, crazy hard boss fights. The draw of it is the story, and basically you have to play through it five times to get the actual story. So you play wow. through like this, play through one, play through B, play through C, so you keep going through it, and I'm on the third playthrough right now, and I just keep learning so much stuff about this world that I absolutely love, so I'm probably gonna play it till I die at this point. It's gonna be great. Do you think you're gonna make it to five all the way through? Yeah, totally. Really? Yeah, awesome. for sure. Maybe I'll mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, you heard what's on our hard drive, so what are you guys playing? Tweet us with the hashtag, what are you playing, and let us know. In just a minute, we'll review the new 2DS XL. It looks cool, but we missed the 3D. And, I won't. Uh, <laughs> and later, you don't want to miss our breakdown of the Ready Player One trailer. You won't believe how many cameos and Easter eggs are packed inside the action, so stay with us. Welcome back to the IGN Show. Nintendo has sold over 67 million 3DS units since the console launched in 2011. But the handheld family just keeps growing. The latest is the new Nintendo 2DS XL. Whether you're looking for an upgrade or you finally just want to take the plunge, you might want to see our review by IGN Associate Editor Casey DeFritis. New Nintendo 2DS XL, the sixth installment of the 3DS family of systems in a nifty little handheld with just a handful of problems. On the surface, the new Nintendo 2DS XL includes everything the new Nintendo 3DS XL does in a smaller, better designed package just without the namesake 3D. C-Stick, check. C-Buttons, check. Stylus, check. Though it is kind of small. 
big screens, check. Front camera, check. Dual back cameras, check. AC adapter, super check. The new 2DS XL is also smaller and considerably lighter than the new 3DS XL, avoiding the somewhat top-heavy weightiness of the new 3DS XL by removing all of the aforementioned features plus the speaker from the top screen. The speakers are awkwardly placed on the bottom of the new 2DS XL though, causing muffled sound and odd vibrations, but many of the changes are very welcome improvements. The game card slot is smartly protected by a new cover, preventing accidental game ejects previous models were prone to. The cover also hides the slot for the microSD, making it easier than ever to get to. No tools required. Overall, the new Nintendo 2DS XL is significantly more comfortable to play than the new Nintendo 3DS XL or the original 2DS. Unlike the new 3DS XL sharp design, the shoulder buttons feel natural, and pressing the ZL and ZR buttons with the tips of your fingers is easy. Once on, I immediately noticed how much brighter the new 2DS XL screen is compared to the original 2DS. That ooh shiny moment quickly passed though when comparing it to the new 3DS XL. The colors displayed on the new 2DS XL are ever so slightly washed out. It's as if the picture's brightness setting was turned up too high, making the blacks not as deep and the colors not as vibrant. The contrast is lacking and turning down the console's actual screen brightness doesn't fix this small issue. Finally, the top screen is slick with a glossy coating and though it looks sleek, it actively diminishes the angle of comfortable viewing. Seriously, this thing is so reflective you could spy on someone behind you with it. Screen issues aside, the processor packs even more of a punch than the new 3DS XLs. It also achieves the same enhanced draw distance, improved frame rate, and less slowdown than new 3DS XL boasts when compared to older 3DS models. You can expect to play any new 3DS exclusive games like Xenoblade Chronicles 3D on the new 2DS XL just as well if not better. The new Nintendo 2DS XL is an obvious upgrade over the ugly doorstop 2DS and is a joy to play on. The hardware updates are welcome and the processor is quick even when dealing with the most notoriously slow loading games. Unfortunately, the screen and audio quality prevents the new Nintendo 2DS XL from being a no-brainer upgrade if you already own a new 3DS XL. Joining me right now is Casey DeFritis who reviewed the new Nintendo 2DS XL for IGN. So what is the deal with this new console? So the new Nintendo 2DS XL is definitely an upgrade from any previous 3DSs that don't have new in the name because it'll play games that only the new 3DSs can play. I know it's very confusing. Thank you so much, Casey. Coming up after the break, I cosplay as a hero from Gears of War. And spoiler alert, it's not Dom, and you thought it would be, but it's totally not. We also delve into some of the secrets of the Ready Player One trailer. Coming up after the break. Everyone here at IGN loves cosplay. I love cosplay. I do a pretty mean Lara Croft and Harley Quinn myself. My sister in arms, Alana Pierce, is a huge Gears of War fan and went all out to look like one of Gears' heroes. It was a uh, no-brainer for me. Before the game even came out, I had people tweeting me saying, you look kind of like Kate Diaz. It's basically a cosplayer's dream to have a character from a franchise that you have always loved in a game you're really, really excited about kind of look a little bit like you. The Gears of War universe is pretty messed up. Some really awful stuff happens to Kate and her family in Gears 4, but I think what I really, really love about her is that even in the darkest time, she still has a sense of humor. Really terrible stuff is happening for her and she never stops being positive. And that's totally inspirational. I wish I could be like that. I think the best thing to do when you're getting into cosplay is to not make things too difficult for yourself. No one is going to hate you if you don't sew every single piece of your costume. I will always love cosplaying and being a cosplayer because of the reaction that you get from kids when they recognize you in person at a convention. It's the best thing ever. I've been cosplaying for about four years now. There are things that vary in difficulty. The most effort that I put into this one because this is a pre-made costume is blood. And that's always a ton of fun is making yourself like weirdly dirty and bloody and putting fake scratches everywhere. This is a fake tattoo and I'm just gonna take me forever to wash this stuff off. And I think it's the artist in me because I draw and paint as well that has always really, really loved the craft. But the best thing about cosplay, hands down, is sharing it with the community. Seeing what other cosplayers have made and constantly just being part of this really, really inspiring, creative community that just keeps on giving. 
Gamers love to trade war stories about the level that they barely beat by the skin of their teeth or the secret that they figured out before the internet did. But discovering and defeating the hidden foes of our countdown of secret bosses is truly a badge of honor. Yeah, yeah, we're aware this is one of the most memorable villains in all of video games, but his presence in Kingdom Hearts was an amazing surprise and provided a wonderful cherry on the top of a Sunday that Square and Disney concocted. After you've made your way through the colorful worlds of your childhood, you're able to fight Sephiroth, Final Fantasy VII's iconic villain. Sora's battle with the one-winged angel is every bit as epic and tough as Cloud's fight in the PS1 Classic. The ultimate battle in Pokemon Gold and Silver is also one of the most emotional fights on this list. Long after you've conquered Kanto and Johto's 16 gyms, you can earn the right to prove that you're the very best, like no one ever was. And to do that, you have to accept one final showdown with Red, the hero you played as back in the original Pokemon Red or Blue. His crew of Pikachu and fully evolved Gen 1 starters makes this battle an unforgettable and nostalgic masterpiece. Back in the era of playground myths and legends, few were as memorable as the fabled third ninja in Mortal Kombat. Aside from Scorpion and Sub-Zero, this green triplet was said to reside in the heart of the game's brutally iconic Spike stage. Sure enough, if you manage to fulfill the strange list of requirements, you're able to face off against the acid-spewing ninja, who would later become the series staple, Reptile. Deep inside the dark, gothic world of Blizzard's Diablo 2 lies a terror. Yes, we're talking about the Cow King? The King of Cows? Despite Blizzard's insistence that there is no cow level, there totally is. If you manage to get there and slay your way through the hordes of bovine beasts, you'll come face to face with the strangest enemy. It's fitting that this list culminates with a pair of foes from one of the most memorable RPGs of all time. After Sephiroth summons Meteor, this pair of uber-powerful enemies emerge from their slumber. Emerald and Ruby Weapon. Emerald's underwater home necessitates finding a specific materia, but even then, good luck at chipping away at its 1 million HP. Likewise, Ruby Weapon has insane defense, impossibly strong attacks, and the ability to completely remove party members from the battle. Anyone who can say that they've conquered both weapons has some serious video video game street cred. So who's your favorite secret boss, or plain old not-so-secret boss? Well, my favorite secret boss is uh, our sweet collab, Diablo 2. That's uh, Uber Mephisto, Uber Bale, and Uber Diablo himself. And those are kind of the act-ending bosses, but if you get to this secret area called Uber Tristram, you have to fight all of them at once. And not just all three of them, but they're actually a super-powered version of themselves. Sounds Uber. It is. It's very Uber. What's your favorite Pokemon boss? Ooh, that's really hard because there's so many really great ones out there. Um, but my favorite thing in every Pokemon game is going to against the Elite Four. Um, you've trained all your Pokemon, you have a set team by then, and taking them and grooming them and getting them ready to fight those final four is just such a great feeling. And every time you always get a really cool cast of characters with the Elite Four, so. It's definitely an, an awesome culmination of skill for sure. Coming up after the break, we take a deep dive look into the very first Ready Player One trailer. Steven Spielberg packed tons of cameos in this thing, and we're gonna reveal them all. Welcome back to the IGN Show. The novel Ready Player One is filled with geek references, and the upcoming film adaptation from Steven Spielberg is no different. The movie's first trailer is filled with Easter eggs, and IGN's Damon Hatfield is here to reveal them. The first trailer for Steven Spielberg's adaptation of Ready Player One is bursting with the pop culture references fans of the book have been waiting for, and some they weren't expecting at all. We spotted a lot, but first, let's address the iron giant in the room. Steven Spielberg has said the lovable robot plays a major role in the film, major enough to get Vin Diesel back to voice him? We hope so. Here we get looks at Lara Croft and Dizzy from Gears of War, the A-Team's van, the Plymouth Fury from Stephen King's Christine, Bigfoot, and the Interceptor from Mad Max are all in the fray. Partival, the movie's protagonist, is driving the DeLorean from Back to the Future. It'll do your nerd heart good to know that the dates and the time circuits are accurate. With the destination time at the top reading October 26th, 1985, the date Marty McFly goes back in time. During the race, we also get our first look at Artemis, a famous gamer in the Oasis. She's riding Kaneda's bike from Akira, which is plastered with Atari, Taito, and Sega logos. Earlier in the trailer, we see ostriches from the 1982 arcade game Joust. When the ostriches are killed, they turn into eggs, just like in the game. 
Here's H, Partsville's best friend. He's using the assault rifle from Halo to mow down Freddy Krueger and Duke Nukem. Just like in many video games, players drop coins when they're killed. This is the Distracted Globe, a zero-gravity nightclub owned by the co-creator of the Oasis, Ogden Morrow. Partival is arriving tomorrow's birthday party after becoming famous, which is probably why Deathstroke and Harley Quinn steal a glance at him as they pass by. Did we miss anything? Freeze frame your way through the Ready Player One trailer yourself, and don't forget to like and subscribe wherever you like to watch IGN. The first trailer for Ready Player One made a huge splash at Comic-Con, but what did you guys think? Oh man, I'm just happy that Freddy Krueger got killed in the trailer. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just get rid of him to begin with. I don't want to be in the same world as him. What is the one character that absolutely has to be in there, no questions asked? Oh, Batman. I'm just going with like the easiest of the three. We don't see Batman, because Batman, we've already seen easy characters. Like, we saw uh, Harley Quinn, just like, thought he's going to be Which whoever pointed out the fact that that was Harley Quinn and Deathstroke in the trailer is just a genius. So. Yeah, yeah and all. Yeah. So he's just like flipping point. around. He's yeah, like, he's getting thrown up by Isengard like he was. Coming up on the next IGN show, we've got an exclusive you don't want to miss. The story behind a new exotic weapon in Destiny 2 called Cold Heart. Plus, we'll review Tacoma, the new game from the creators of Gone Home, and tell you everything that's been added to Player Unknown's Battlegrounds. All that, plus the top 10 worst video game rewards of all time. Sometimes winning is worse than losing. That does it for this episode. Thank you so much for watching. As always, keep it locked to IGN. Be our friends on socials. You won't regret it. Bye. Okay, bye.